He was a major player at the two-day Paris Climate Finance Summit that's just concluded. Former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is Joe Biden's special presidential envoy for climate. Thank you for uh, joining us here on France 24. My great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, uh, lots to talk about coming out of these two days. But first, I got to say, Americans don't do half measures. Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris climate deal and then uh, Joe Biden uh, not only goes back in, but uh, goes in with this huge uh, green investment plan, huge subsidies, hundreds of billions uh, uh, of dollars, which, by the way, have attracted uh, investors from around the globe. Yep, they have. It well, you know, it's, I don't think it's a definition of what Americans do. I think that it's a definition of what happens when you have somebody who is, you know, out of touch completely and doesn't inform themselves and who makes a decision based on God knows what. Pulling out of the Paris Agreement was really hurtful for America, but in the end, Americans stayed in the agreement. All across our country, the American people wanted to continue to make progress, and we did. And even during Donald Trump's tenure, uh, about 75 percent of all the new electricity that came online in the United States was from renewables. That's a remarkable story. And so I would, I like, you know, Donald Trump may have pulled out of it, but the American people stayed in. And now President Biden is making up for that with a remarkable set of uh, uh, initiatives that are helping to make a difference in terms of the meetings we've had in the last two years in Glasgow, Sharm el Sheikh. And now we're working to try to make a difference. Yeah, that tomorrow. energy transition uh, bill, the, the known as the Inflation Reduction Act, yes, sir. It, it turbocharges. Uh, we hope so. And yes, there's evidence that it's really having a good impact. Now, uh, the jury's still out because there's been a bit of a subsidy war now that's born of that but with Europe, uh, uh, yeah. most notably. And th that's you know, the, the, everybody needs to, to 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 get their 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 energy transition in high gear. But is that taking money away from those countries that were present at this summit? Uh, if you're building a seawall or solar panels, would you rather send your money to the United States or to West Africa? Well, I don't think it's an either or. It's not a binary choice. The fact is that uh, uh, President Biden has energized, no pun intended, efforts in America in order to do our part, because it's a global effort. Every country needs to be at the table. And President Biden's making certain that the United States is going to meet its goals. But, but the investment money is finite. Yeah. But no, <laughs> actually... Uh, there are trillions of dollars waiting to be invested. That's what President Macron was addressing in this particular conference, is how do we take those trillions of dollars and excite them to get into the marketplace now in developing uh, economies, emerging economies. And, uh, you know, but, but those economies, by the way, are not where the problem of the climate crisis is emanating from. There are 20 countries the largest economies in the world that are responsible for almost 80 percent of all the emissions that are creating the problem. So what the president, what President Macron is trying to do and all of us are trying to do is find a way to get the trillions of dollars needed for this energy transition to be deployed, to be invested so that we accelerate the transition. And, and the president, President Macron, assembled about 37 trillion dollars of assets owned and managed in the one room, listening to how we can come together to deploy some of that money. So we need to de-risk. We need to help that money feel more comfortable in being invested in some of these but, uh, trickier places. But again, these are not charities. These are private no, companies or, or sovereign yeah. wealth funds, and they want a return on their buck. And they will get a return on their buck. That's the whole point. But what we need to do is get the fear out of the atmosphere and address some of their concerns. And there are concerns. You know, is the, is, the, is the legal system such that we can arbitrate or take care of a problem if there is a problem? Uh, will our money be safer here than it might be somewhere else? Uh, there are currency challenges. There are political challenges. So everybody has to kind of step up and begin to take the risk factor out of those investments and help deploy that money. A lot of different suggestions were put on the table in the last uh, 48 hours. And, and I think uh, 
It was really interesting, actually, hearing from a lot of the leaders from Africa and Latin America and elsewhere who came here uh, to have this discussion. Yeah, and when it comes to investing and borrowing, a major player is China, represented by its prime minister uh, at, at this conference. Uh, you exchanged with Li Keqiang? We had a very brief uh, hello and an opportunity to say hi uh, uh, as we were moving in and out of the thing. I didn't have a formal meeting, but uh, it was worthwhile, and I'm glad I was able to have a brief discussion with him. Climate is one issue where both President Xi and President Biden have said we should not be the prisoners of other issues that we are concerned about and we have differences on. We need all of us to deal with the climate challenge. So my hope is that that will open up an opportunity for China and the United States to cooperate again, as we were last year and before, uh, in order to try to accelerate the transition. Uh, the, one of the m big issues China was involved in this is uh, how to get over the line debt restructuring. There's some 50 countries in the world uh, that are either in default or close to it. And uh, after coming out of COVID and with inflation that's gone up these past years, uh, there was a deal on the sidelines for Zambia, uh, and it, again, this involved in, in, in part China. Uh, is it something, though, when you look at the, uh, uh, the task at hand, how, how do you stop these countries from falling back into a debt trap? The debt trap is, is a serious concern, and we all share uh, a, a recognition that the current policies of the World Bank, of the multilateral development banks, IMF, et cetera, they need to be fine-tuned. They need to be brought into this moment, 2023 climate crisis, and the need to be able to uh, liberate these countries from, from the amazing burden that they have at certain times. For instance, if you have a massive hurricane or a cyclone or a huge flood like in Pakistan, if you're burdened with greater debt, you can't respond. You can't take care of the people. And you can't do the things you need to do to move forward on avoiding those crises in the future. Those For institutions. Instance, adapting, hardening your, your defenses. Those institutions you talk about, of course, they answer to their shareholders, the largest ones the United States, for That's both the World Bank exactly and the IMF. exactly why you need this meeting. Because you need to address the legitimate concerns of people whose money that they have in a fund comes from people who expect you to make money or at least protect their money. You have pensioners. Pension funds are invested. You can't put pension funds at risk in, a, in an investment where you don't have an adequate sense of fiduciary uh, confidence that it's going to be But the protected. criticism leveled at the United States is that mm. it's, it's, uh, there should be a recapitalization. There needs to be more money for the IMF and well, there the are ways Bank. to yeah, but there and, are ways. You, and to do that, does that mean the U.S.'s uh, share I, I, at the board is diluted? There is, at this point in time, no one's judgment that I've heard who's involved in this world of finance and efforts to try to fix the MDBs, the multilateral development banks, who is saying we need a new capital infusion. What we need is to use the existing rules to their fullest capacity in order to be able to lend more money. And you can lend more money without having a capital infusion. If you, if you, I mean, there have been very tough restraints on the way in which the banks have behaved, which don't, if you get rid of them, those restraints, it doesn't threaten your AAA rating. So what people want to do is try to first move to unleash these banks from restrictive interpretations of existing rules. Then, after that, if we don't have enough, maybe it'll be time to consider whether you need a capital. Because you need a lot. You talked about trillions you yourself. Tri yes, and you and, and uh, you the, four there's a recent... So, uh, every year for the next seven years and maybe beyond. And at least one trillion of that has to go to the developing world. Uh, I think more, more than that may go to the developing world. But... Uh, the developing world right now would be hard-pressed to be able to produce the projects that are going to take a full trillion dollars. But over a period of time, that will accelerate, and you'll be able to use a significant amount of this money on this transition. But, but part of it, this is important. 20 major economies of the world equal 80% of all the emissions. 
Those 20 countries are pretty developed. And so they need to be taking, uh, uh, you know, steps to address their transition. Many of them are. The EU, UK, uh, Japan, Korea, Canada, the United States. All of those entities have adopted plans that, if they implement them, can keep the 1.5 degree target in range. About 10 countries have not yet raised their ambition to a level that actually keeps faith with the Paris Accord. The Paris are you, Agreement. Are you including China in that? Uh, China still has to raise some ambition, even as China has done an amazing job of deploying more renewables than anyone else in the world. So China's moving very rapidly to, to try to transition, but we believe there are ways for us to work together to try to be able to do more. And, and, and I hope, because China and the United States together equal about 40 percent of all the emissions, if we can't cooperate together, it's really going to be hard to be able to reach the goal. Did Joe Biden make your life a little more difficult this week by calling Xi Jinping a dictator? Well, I, look, I do, I, we do not get involved in the back and forth. Uh, my counterpart in China, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, is a friend. We worked together for 20, 25 years. We know each other. We trust each other. It's important to stay away from whatever the political back and forth is. We want to find a way to change this dynamic to have climate crisis turn into something that could actually, between China and the United States, open up the opportunities for us to work together on other things, too. John Kerry, two quick final questions. First of all, what do you say to developing nations who argue that uh, they see the United States going all in uh, behind Ukraine? How come uh, the same kind of amount of uh, money generated, the wartime economy mentality, isn't happening for the developing world here for these sustainable goals? Well, I've argued that it should be. And uh, I'm in favor of treating this particular challenge right now as if we were at war, because I think we have to organize ourselves in our countries far more effectively to deploy the resources that we have today and to begin to develop the technologies and the resources we need to win this battle. This is a big challenge. A lot of people sort of treat it indifferently. Or, or they don't think they can make a difference. Everybody can make a difference in this. And we need everybody to be engaged in this challenge. We have to, you know, we have to uh, get electricity to people who don't have it. We need to use the electricity we have today to decarbonize our societies. Or we have to capture the carbon that is uh, the, 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 uh, the egregious um, part of... Uh, creating this, this uh, challenge that we all face of the warming of the planet, et cetera. It comes from one thing. It comes from the emissions that come from the burning of fossil fuels that are not trapped, caught. And, and, and if we don't catch them, then we're going to continue to add to this problem. So it's not a, it is not a rocket science challenge. We don't have to sit around and scratch our heads and say, what's right. doing this? We know what's doing this. It's the way we propel our vehicles, the way we heat our homes, the way we uh, light our, our studios and our, 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 our homes and factories. That's what has to change. It has to become carbon free. And the faster we get there, the better chance we have of avoiding the worst consequences. Uh, in the meantime, my brother this summer is going to be hosting me at his uh, seaside home in Brittany, where it rains a lot. He's joked that... Uh, uh, we'll soon be refugee climates, uh, uh, ret climate refugees at his house. I know you have long-standing ties to Brittany. I do. Uh, is it going to be the new Saint-Tropez? Well, it certainly is uh, a, a place to escape the unbearable heat and to find a terrific climate for uh, the summertime. There's no question about that. Uh, it's hot in a lot of places, and that heat is going to drive people to other places. Uh, it already is in many parts of the world. In fact, we're losing literally millions of people to extreme heat in various parts of the world. We're losing 8 million people a year to the air pollution that comes from greenhouse gas emissions. So I think there are a lot of places that people will seek for refuge. It may well be uh, that Brittany is one, but I'm trying not to overcrowd it at this point. Right. We can help it. John Kerry, so many thanks for speaking with us here on Thank France you. 24. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you for joining us here.